In early February, a video on TikTok went viral of a huge guitar collection found. Or at least, that's what a lot of people thought by the description. What this ended up being is an estate sale of somebody who's still living, he just wanted to downsize his collection. So I've been waiting months for all these cool guitars to finally come up to the auction block, and it's finally here. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglis Guitar Show. That's right, it's the semi-what famous Estate 360 estate sale that all guitar players have just been waiting months for. Now, in today's episode, I'm going to focus on the Gibsons, of which there's well over 100, but there's about 230 musical instruments within this collection. Now, while viewing all these, keep in mind there's a 15% buyer's premium on top of what you bid, plus local sales tax, which this appears to be in California, so that's another 10%, and it seems they want you to pick it up. But they say shipping might be an option, but it seems like UPS is going to come pick it up, then pack it. So budget an additional $300 to $400 for that process. So without any further ado, let's check them out. Starting things off, we have a vintage Gibson Melody Maker. This is the second iteration. The first one was a single cutaway shape, then we moved into this double cut before we got to the freaky fish-shaped ones of the mid-60s. This one's not in too bad of shape. In fact, I would actually say pretty clean for one of these. And it's coming in a non-original hard shell case. I'd put a rough estimate of $2,000 on that one. Next, we got one of these 335 Customs. So this is the mid-ranking tier of the Solid Body 335 group. There was a version under this that had the Tim Shaw PAFs, and then one version over top of this that had the cool gloss finish. But this is one that has the dual Dirty Fingers pickups with the coil splitting option. Personally, I prefer the standards out of this run, but you gotta love the cool tuner tips. From these photos, yes, I can guarantee those are the original pickups yet in there, and this one seems to have some player's wear, and should see somewhere around 1500. But here's what I love about this auction, it's got a little bit of everything. Here we've got an RD Custom. I haven't done too many videos on RDs, it looks like this one's kind of bashed up on the edges of our headstock. But it looks like the fretboard's in pretty good condition on this one. However, our hardware's looking really gnarly on that. These must have been in storage for quite some time. Knowing that the top electronics look like that, I would be really worried if this Moog board even works, because these have 9 volt batteries in here, and it's possible that could have exploded if it was left in. That's pretty much the one downside about this auction is they don't have any guarantee on the function. So if you do bid on any of these, please do keep that in mind. Don't go too crazy to win the auction. You should see that at least to about 2500 Kind of interesting that it has a modern day reissue case when that's a true vintage original. Speaking of true vintage originals, did you know these things even existed? In the late 60s, Gibson did melody makers in the shape of SGs. They are really cool and they sell for pretty good money yet today. But they also made a bass version. It's kind of like an EBO except for we have a giant pick card over top of them. But I didn't realize you could find slotted headstock versions. If I remember correctly, within the EBO lore, you could check out this episode to learn even more about it, there was only like one or two years where they offered the slotted headstock. And finding this in the Pelham blue color? That's pretty darn cool. It seems to be in almost suspiciously good condition. So that's either a mint condition collectible or been refinished. But next, hey, look what has finally shown up. I made a whole episode last year teaching you guys my process of how to find really rare guitars. And I was trying to help somebody find one of these voodoo explorers in that episode using all those techniques and we came up dry. But lo and behold, in one week, three of these things popped up. One was on Reverb, one was over in Japan, and now we've got this one at this auction. So not that you can really tell from this photo, but it's a Swamp Ash body. You get the red headstock logo, which at that time was like a very new thing. It was cool. Now, whether you're like your skull guy on your fretboard or not, that's personal preference. But you've got the ebony fretboard with our voodoo style pickups. And of course you get the red grain fill. And it looks like this still has the original case too. So if you've been waiting for one of these voodoo explorers, trust me, this auction could get crazy. Like that's a $4,500 example if it's as clean as it looks. I wouldn't worry too much about the electronics. Just replace them later if something happens to be off. But then next we have the Voodoo Les Paul. Basically all the same stuff, but in Les Paul shape. However, you do have to keep in mind the Les Paul Voodoo was reissued as a particular dealer exclusive a couple of years ago. But this appears to be an original, and is all original as far as I can tell from these photos, outside of maybe missing your switch tip and our strap buttons. And yes, it's got the original Voodoo case. So naturally, if they got the Explorer and the Les Paul, of course they got the SG here, but it's listed as neck damage. My biggest question is it looks like a U-Haul transported all these guitars to the estate liquidators. So I'm curious, did this happen in transit there or has it always been broken and the owner never really got around to fixing it? This photo is so wonky. <laughs> it's great that it didn't actually break through the headstock veneer though. And oh wow, yeah, that's a super easy repair. Nice flat surface, just have to clean it up a little bit. However, it looks like it might be missing a sliver of wood right there. I could still see that thing fetching 800 bucks. 
But this next listing tells me this clearing place isn't necessarily an expert in Gibson guitars. 2001 Birdland. And then I saw this pick guard and all of this discoloration here. I know exactly what's happened here. And sure enough, they plug this into an online serial number decoder and it takes it like this. Zero for the 2000s. Then it comes all the way over here for one, making it a 2001, 10th day of the year, 300th in production. But no, this is a decal serial number. Zero, zero stands for 1976. And that's when they were still using real celluloid pick guards down here. So what you're seeing right here with our frets being green, <laughs> neon green at that, is the off-gassing of this material eating away at the metals on this guitar. This will also ruin the finish. However, this almost just looks like residue. So it might be able to clean off, but... <laughs> I love those frets. I would almost have to leave them alone. I would love to have neon green frets on a guitar. But hey, there you go. There's actually a hole in your pick guard. That should have been removed a long time ago. Pretty much all the electronics on this guitar are going to need a deep cleaning. Typically, the pickups still work, but definitely bid conservatively on this one. It should still hit at least five to 6,000 though. Next up, a slightly better condition, L4. I don't really have too much to add to this one. The back isn't too fancy, but at least we have the serial number, which is a little bit wonky because it was made in the future. 2023, 247th day of the year in Kalamazoo. <laughs> I don't deal a lot with the jazzy archtop guitar, so even I don't necessarily have an answer for that one, but I have run into them having a weird different serialization system because this COA style tells me 90s to early 2000s-ish. So my guess would actually be 2000s. Three. But this one I'm really interested in. So it's a Les Paul Elegant in what is described as a one-of-a-kind distressed silver finish. Typically in the collector circles, this is known as the Elegant Silver Flow. There's also a Gold Flow, which I've kind of documented in this weird one-off. But I used to own one of these Silver Flows and I regret selling it before I could do the full review and documentation. In the collection video, you can see it right here. But this one is a true one-off in the fact that it does not have the black back and sides. They did the silver flow all over. So maybe this was the first one. I'd have to check serial numbers. Then they just decided that, ah, doing it all over is a little bit extreme. Let's give the rest of them black backs. Because it's got the original case, and you don't always get COAs in this era. So having it say all that, that's a really cool piece. Even though it's got some finish checking, I wouldn't mind adding that one to my collection because it's like a really cool match to my gold one. But here's one from the mid 2010s era, a Les Paul Futura. I love the Futura series. It's basically like the Les Paul tribute of today, except for you have a humbucker in the bridge and a P90 sidewinder in the neck. So it's a humless P90. You can swap that out for a regular one if that bothers you. But you don't find P90 equipped studios in modern day production very often at all. In fact, that's actually a really good idea for Gibson to bring out. I remember really liking these things but it looks like some sort of a rat has kind of chewed through our lid ribbon over here typically these will sell in the 1000 to 1500 dollars range sometimes a little bit more for the nice colors like the purple but this got me excited there were a lot of guitar of the week and guitar of the month series examples in this collection so i thought is this guy gonna have the complete set? Unfortunately, no, but he's got a lot. So I've already documented this version of the SG3. It's personally my favorite because you get the Swamp Ash body, but there's also three other iterations of this within there. But here you can see some of the finish checking. So I think all these guitars were not necessarily properly stored because if they were just stored in a trailer somewhere, yeah, that's not so kind on nitro finishes. But this next custom is really cool. It's a Koa top. But going back to our serial number, it's a Koa top from 2011. Around 2018, 2019, there was a dealer who did a whole bunch of these things. But in 2011, this was very special. And it's always fun to play around with the makeup of a Les Paul custom, because that's what makes custom collecting so much fun. That should bring at least five grand for him. But now we got a firebrand. That somebody has put a pretty ugly homemade pick guard on but uh, okay at least it's one of the true fire brands i love this version because all these black dots and all the dings on the headstock they were like that from the factory it was in at this time to distress furniture in a very similar way so that's where they got the idea for the whole fire brand and relicking in many ways these are the very first relic gibson guitar dating all the way back to 1980 Man, that's a really chunky pick guard, but they put it there because they started to see that they were wearing through the finish. So rather than worn finish, they decided to put four screws through it. But nice, looks like we still have the original T top, so we can't complain. Should fetch in the ballpark of one to one and a half thousand. Here's a 1960 reissue Les Paul. Looks like the serial number would put it to 2007. Case seems to back that up as well. And it's got a nice top for an RO. 
Here's another one from the Guitar of the Week series. It's the Les Paul Supreme Autumn Burst with figured ebony fretboard. No fancy inlays, and to be honest, it's never been my favorite Supreme in the world, but it has its own charm. Supremes have really been growing on me lately, simply because they're out of production. But take special attention, you've got some chipping lacquer around here. Now it's not fully chipped yet, it's just started to lift, and you can kind of see it in the other areas starting to form. So keep that in mind if you're bidding on this one. This photo doesn't really do the flame top much justice, but this one helps a bit. And the back is okay, but good, we've got the original case. Here we have another Burnland, but this one's definitely more so modern. You can tell it doesn't have the real celluloid pick guard. I suppose it could be real celluloid, it just hasn't started to off-gas and deteriorate yet. But I can tell it's more modern due to the headstock style. But yep, that one's got a whole bunch of finished checking up here too. But unfortunately, I don't see any serial number shots. I mean, the case would seem to suggest 90s, but I think it's even later than that. So I suppose it could be a late 90s one. Here's the final guitar of the month guitar, the Holy V. I've documented the Holy Explorer, and I swear I had one of these too at some point in time. It's just a, kind of a 58 mahogany flying V that's been chopped up. Yeah, they're interesting. But they're also just one pickup in the bridge with a single volume control. So they've got one job to do and one job to do only. Here's another guitar of the month. This is the Push Tone, where they give you two sets of pickups that you can play with. That you pop out of the front and they're on a quick connect system essentially. So it's pretty quick to change them out. But you've got the P94s and then a regular set of humbuckers. But what makes them cool is the ebony fretboard and the real wooden inlays. But this thing really shocked me to see. It's a Tree of Life inlay on a regular Les Paul Custom. Typically when you get a Tree of Life guitar, they do other fancy stuff. But this is just a natural finish custom, two piece top. It appears to be 68 in style, since it's got the ABR1 bridge on it. Or at least that's how it looked from the photos. But it's a combination of Mother of Pearl and Abalone inlays. Going all the way up the fretboard. Now is it a little bit gaudy? Yeah, but it's different. These mainly appeal to hardcore collectors rather than players. But this serial number dates it to 2011. And it's just billed as a Les Paul Custom F. F for flame top. We saw the fire brand, here's a regular, the Paul. This one actually appears to be in pretty good shape for its age. Kind of hard to tell if it's collector collector grade or just really clean. It looks like replaced toggle switch cap, but everything else looks all right. We do have a little bit of finish wear right here, but in this photo I can see there's some significant finish wear and some nice wood grain back here. But wow, still even has the plastic over the back plate. And hey, it's got a later chainsaw case with it. Here's the brother model SG Fire brand that I just documented the prototype of. This one's got a whole bunch of pieces going on with it, constructing its body. It's got some unique wood grain on the back too. Also from the Guitar of the Month series, we have one of the Longhorns. They made two different versions of these. One was in this blue flame top, which came first, and then they later did the Sunburst one. It's part of the Guitar of the Month series. There's a thousand of each finish. It's essentially a unique double cut shape that has unique binding on it. It comes stock with EMG pickups, and it has a piezo element down here. But unfortunately, the finish checking strikes again. They also have one of the Dark Fire guitars. Be very careful buying that one, because those of Robot Electronics can get kind of finicky as they age. But these are always fun to turn into projects and just make into regular guitars. And these photos didn't turn out too good, but it's an ebony fretboard with carbon fiber inlay. And it's one of the few Les Paul models to feature the flower pot inlay. But it's this listing that really got me excited for what might be in this auction. They have one of the rare Union Jack Explorers. I already have three of these in my collection. I don't think I, I necessarily need another one. <laughs> but these are pretty much the most desirable designer series guitars. Whereas most designs sell at slightly less than a regular color, these ones sell for ridiculous premiums. I mean, these are pretty prone to finish checking and chipping around the tuners, so I wouldn't worry too much about this one if you've been waiting for the right Union Jack to show up. But it's seems to be about average condition for the most part. Still has the original pickups and just a little bit of clear coat wear, but we've got the original case. These things can vary from five to $10,000. It really just depends on if the right people see this auction. I mean, it could go for 2,500 bucks and you could get a steal because that's the thing. Their first TikTok over here just blew up 620,000 views, but everything since that has been relatively paltry in comparison and it took them two months to get these things up. I wonder if they missed the hype train. So if you're local, you might be able to get some good deals on these. Here's a 2008 Gibson I. A modern take on an SG, I have documented one of the prototypes of these, but not the actual red one. It wasn't my favorite guitar in the world, but yeah, it's it's one of those weird things Gibson did in 2008. Then we had one of those cool Triumph basses from the 70s. One of the Joe Bonamassa Studio Gold Tops. What's nice about this is it appears to be relatively unplayed condition. They haven't even touched that fretboard. 
This is another big one to watch. Clean condition custom shop Angus Young guitars don't show up all that often, and this one appears to be in pretty darn good shape, because it even still has the sticker on the pick guard. I'm not sure if these were rusty from the factory because it's VOS, so that might be some aging related issues, but you know, everything I'm seeing here so far points to it being a pretty decent example that you might want to add to your collection, especially because it still has the COA. I would say a low estimate would be 10,000. Then we have a 50th anniversary, Les Paul with the Bigsby. Another cool 80s explorer. The official color of this one is Night Violet. And I wouldn't mind having one of these in my collection because they're just cool. Prior to the mod collection demo shop days, you just didn't find that many purple Gibson guitars. So naturally, when you find out that they did exist very briefly in like 83, 84, 85, that's going to drum up some demand. But I just love the fact that it has the burst on the back too. Now these are alder bodies with the maple necks. It's very common for the super finish checking to occur. So it's not necessarily just how they were stored. Although I'm sure it didn't help but they had one of the Don Felder double necks that we were talking about in the 13 episode. This one's number 12, so not quite what they're going for. This thing is Guitar of the Week number one, the SG Supreme bass. It's got a flame top, otherwise it's similar to an EB3. Had it not been part of the Guitar of the Week collection, probably wouldn't want one for myself, but I gotta do it. And hey, speaking of the Holy Explorer, of course, he's got one of those things too. Outside of the shock factor, they're really not worth it. They're satin finishes, holes cut out of them. At least this one has the two pickups. Unless you're a collector or just looking for something unique, there's really no reason to buy one of these. Because it'd just be cheaper to hack up some faded Explorer. Yet a Thunderbird base. And get this, not only a victory base, but it's also fretless, which is just incredibly fascinating because it doesn't even look like it was an aftermarket modification. And if it was, they replaced the entire fretboard on the neck because you don't see any like filled in fret slots. And yes, we've got the original diamond posi lock buttons. This was an R9 with a Karina top. We have documented Karina R9s on the show, but it had a maple top before. So matching a Koa top with a Karina back and sides, that gives you a very <laughs> interesting cross section here. But that is certainly one of the more unique R9s I've seen in a while. There was also a Nighthawk in this collection, but what makes this version even more rare, it's the Factory Floyd Rose with locking nut system. Not the guitar for me, but I'm sure somebody would love that. Here's another big one. The Music Rising Les Pauls are just insane. They sell between seven and 10 grand nowadays. And these are just regular Les Paul standard USA production. They're not even custom shop. But what's nice about this one is it's got a very good color variation on it. I wish we didn't have quite as much yellow here, but as far as these things go, that is a prime example. You don't see these every day, the Sammy Hagar Red Rocker Les Paul. I have documented it in this episode. Kind of looks like a slash Rosa Corsa, but you have the chicken foot emblem up here. Kind of controversial, but it is what it is. He has a wine red 2550, which is one of the less common finishes. But let's see how its condition is. Headstock, okay, a little bit of finish checking. Ooh, a little bit of corrosion on the truss rod cover. Unfortunately, those are hard to restore. Now the brass nut, that's a whole different story. Just a little bit of steel wool, it's perfectly fine. The top's looking okay. These aren't necessarily known for crazy figure tops. Gold hardware's looking nice. Knobs are original. But this is one I'd worry about because the Series 7 tarback pickups, it's very common for one of the coils to go dead. And the only way you're ever going to know is you're going to try to coil split it and you won't get a sound difference. So knowing that these are untested, that would make me worried to pay crazy money in the bidding war. Because I mean, after a good polish job, this one looks like it would be pretty good if you don't mind that it's a factory second anyways which is just kind of like a demo or a mod guitar of today. It doesn't really seem to affect value too much. It just changes who's willing to buy it. And therefore, sometimes you have to discount them a little bit more than the factory firsts. Next up here, another one from the Guitar of the Month series. It is the original SG Diablo, the first run in the gloss red finish. Towards the end of the run, they did a silver one as well, but that had a satin finish. And I'm a big fan of this Lavender Sparkle standard. I love the finish. It reminds me of my Abalone Lavender Les Paul Custom. But then you've got your fretboard here. It's, it's a, such a unique streakiness to it. You don't see that too often on Gibson guitars. It's got its custom shop case and the serial number paints it to 2008. And outside of some discoloration around the tuners, it appears to be in pretty good shape and was a complete Lavender Sparkle finish. 
He had one of the early L5S guitars that had the low impedance electronics. You might be able to get a good deal on that. Here's another one of those boo-boo guitars. 2004 Les Paul Artisan. Nope, that didn't happen. This one is from 1977 with a leading 06 on a decal. So who knows, maybe that error will help you get a better deal on this one, but it looks like our finish has heavily yellowed on this one, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. We've got one of the limited edition 2009 Florentine cut Les Paul standards. I've documented one of these, but what makes it unique is it's not a Venetian car that's rounded over. It's sharp and pointy. He also had a regular 2004 standard with root beer finish. And oh my goodness, this RD standard, that has reached stage four, my friends. That is grungy. I love that. That's one of my favorite guitars I've seen. You can't even call this thing yellowed anymore. It's just orange. And for whatever reason, the RD artists did not get binding on their fretboards, but they still got the ebony with the mother of pearl blocks. But that natural finish has checked to perfection. You've got just the right amount of wear everywhere. This is what everybody tries to replicate when they try to relic a guitar. But all things considered, it's really not beat up, except for on the back of the horn right here. So that was somebody's fellow bar friend. And hey, missing this part of the cover is actually helpful right here, because you can tell that the battery hasn't exploded. But here's one of the 2002 Angus Young SG signatures. We just documented the prototype of that model not too long ago. That'll probably sell for around 3000 at auction, I'd bet. He's got one of the great Joe Perry Boneyard signatures. Definitely a model I still need to review, just haven't really found one at the right price yet. One of the salt and pepper double cut Les Paul standards. A beautiful Studio Silverburst. A Class 5 in Cranberry Red. Another VSG, this guy has so many of them, but I'm not gonna lie, I'm really interested in this one. The headstock looks good, and I've never seen this one before, Firebrand VSG STD. <laughs> That particular branding must have been very shortly lived. But the reason I like it is this wood grain is so fuzzy looking. It's got that characteristic yellow grain fill that they like to use in the 80s. And once you see it on guitars, you kind of start to like it. However, I don't know if they started to use this in today's production if I would like it as much. It's more so, uh, it was cool back then. So I'll personally be watching that one. And then here's another 2550. But somebody has replaced our pit guard with a true celluloid one, or at least that's what I thought. Okay, now that's just a completely custom pit guard. That almost looks like a wood engraving. Not gonna lie, it actually looks pretty good. Here's one of those 2010 Nighthawks in Memphis Mojo finish. We just recently documented one of those in a different color. Also on the auction block is one of the BB King Lucille's, but not just your regular version. It's the one that actually has no Gibson branding on it. It's just labeled BB King. Of course, if you got all the, the Pauls and the SGs, you need a Marauder. That one's got a nice rugged vibe to it. And now he's got a regular studio, but it's labeled as a custom leather back. Oh, <laughs> it's not even a good leather back. Like sometimes you see really plush lined back guitars from the 60s, but yeah, it's basically a snap on cover on the back that's designed to help either make the guitar more comfortable or so you don't scratch it up. And in the process, you, you put these giant rivets in your guitar and uh, yeah. I think they're more harmful than helpful, but you know, whatever, you do you. There's probably a reason it was done on a cheaper model. See, that's an example of something I would never do myself, but if I could pick this up for 500 bucks, I would think that is cool. Here's a 59 standard. I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into this one because of the fact that it has this style sticker. You would find that one in the 2000s era. Now it's something that nobody would have cared about brand new, but now that it's 15-ish years old and so many things have changed in the custom shop, it starts to become cool. But I would hazard a guess that one might be from the year 2000. But that is going to wrap it up for our nice and long episode tonight. If you're interested in bidding in any of this stuff, it looks like their website is bid.estate360.com. I'm sure you can find it there. I'm not sponsored by these guys. I've just been patiently waiting all these listings to be made. And this collection does have some pretty cool stuff. All right, Chocolateites, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.